So I started to, to think about the ideas that were shaping our system of money and banking and why things had gone wrong. And <clears throat> I went back and I read Keynes's general theory. Now Keynes's general theory, published in 1936, is still regarded by many as one of the great books of the 20th century. If you look in the Sunday newspapers every now and then, they give you the 100 books published in the 20th century that we're all supposed to have read. If you ever read Keynes's general theory, you will find that most of it is completely incomprehensible. Bits of it are beautifully written. The bits that are beautifully written are all about his instinct, which was absolutely right, that intrinsic uncertainty, fundamental uncertainty, was absolutely essential to understanding the causes of the Great Depression in the 1930s, and that the subsequent attempts by economists to try to play the game of being a physicist were going in the wrong direction. In the book I call this radical uncertainty. Uncertainty which is so deep that we can't imagine the various things that could happen in the future. And if we can't imagine the things that could happen in the future, then we certainly can't attach probabilities to them and we can't create markets in these risks. We can't price those risks. And one of the ways in which finance, I think, created a misleading and spurious impression of confidence before the crisis was a belief supported by academic economists and finance experts that somehow by creating new financial instruments, new markets in them, we were pricing more and more risks, filling in the gaps in the markets that didn't exist. And that somehow we were converging on a process in which all risks about the future could be priced in financial markets and so taken into account and the risk allocated among those best able to bear it. But of course that is simply untrue. There are many things that we can't imagine in the future and these things we can't price. Many of the most important markets in the world do not exist. And this causes serious problems for the economic theory of why an economy is or is not self-stabilizing. So let me try and give you <clears throat> an example. The, the biggest commodity market in the world today is, is the oil market. Um, massive uh, numbers of people, big companies producing oil, exploring for oil, big companies buying oil. Now, if ever there was something in which you would expect there to be a market in the f for the future, purchase and sale of oil, it will be the oil market. And indeed, if you want to buy oil two years forward, you can buy oil two years forward. If you want to buy oil ten years forward, or sell oil ten years forward, you can't. The markets are too thin. They don't exist. Now, why is that? There's some explanation behind it. And there is a very good explanation behind it. Of course, the oil producers, whether they be big oil companies, or people exploring the tar sands of Canada, or people engaged in fracking here and in other countries, would love to be able to sell oil 10 years forward because they could then hedge or lay off their risks in the investment in the facilities that they're currently exploring and developing. So they would love this market to exist. And there are plenty of big companies like airline companies that would love to be able to buy oil 10 years forward because they could hedge the risks about future uncertainty about the oil price. So why isn't there then a market in oil 10 years forward when actually you can think of potential buyers and potential sellers? The answer is that the airline companies can't sell their tickets 10 years forward because we, perfectly sensibly and rationally, do not plan our lives so ridiculously far in advance that we know where we want to fly to in 10 years' time and book tickets today at a known price. Because airline companies can't sell their tickets, they will be taking huge risk to buy the oil 10 years in advance, not knowing whether they could sell the tickets, whether some different fuel would be invented, uh, or whether a new airline company could come in in 10 years' time if the price at that point was very different from the price that they had paid 10 years earlier. And if you don't have a large number of these markets in a world of an unknowable future, then it turns out that the economy, the market economy, is simply not self-stabilizing. In the 1930s, Keynes was trying to persuade people that the market economy was not sta self-stabilizing. Classical economists said, but how can that be? If supply and demand in every market is balanced, prices are allowed to move to equate supply and demand, and if that's true in every single market, then it's got to be true in aggregate. 
Hence, there can't be any un unemployment or unused resources. To which Keynes just pointed to the unemployment queues and said, well, look at them, they're unemployed. Now, it took economists quite a long time, this is usually the problem with economists, to work out how something that obviously is true in practice has to be true in theory as well. And they, the, the, the answer of economists was, because all the key markets for future spending and saving don't exist today. There are missing markets. So this adding up across markets is not a valid logical argument to use. And many of the things that really matter about future investment and future savings cannot be transacted in markets. Markets don't give signals. So if someone decides, for example, that they would like to produce a new product or to expand their current line of production, but it takes quite a long time for the investment to be put in place, the output won't be available in the future. But if the market for those products in the future doesn't exist, there's no mechanism by which potential consumers can signal their demand that they want to buy in the future. And if, for example, people decide to save more today because they become more cautious or just don't want to buy today, producers simply don't know whether it's because people want to buy in the future rather than today or because they're simply too cautious to spend at all. And it makes an enormous difference which of those two it is. The market does not provide the signal. Hence, you can get booms and slumps. And this is germane to understanding what the role of money and banking really is. Because one of the most extraordinary things about modern economics that none of you who isn't a professional economist will find plausible is that if you look at textbooks on graduate economics, how does an economy function? Or look at the computer models that central banks use to forecast the future when they set interest rates. Money and banks simply don't exist, either in the computer models or in the textbooks. They're absolutely missing. And then in a lecture, somebody will wave a hand and say, yeah, money, well, we have money to buy stuff. It's a, it, no one really thinks deeply about the role of money and banking in the modern world of econ economics as physics. This has had profound consequences because the reason money and banks matter is precisely because markets for things are missing, precisely because the world is full of radical uncertainty, and precisely because people want to hold money or liquidity against an unknowable and unpredictable future. So that when in the financial crisis in 2007-8, there was a sudden uh, de increased demand for liquidity, it's because people lost confidence. They wanted to hold something. They didn't know what they wanted to buy in the future. They didn't know what they would do in the future. They wanted to put their potential spending power in something where they could reasonably rely on its value, and it was safe. And the answer was money. And that's why in a modern economy, there has to be some collective government body, which typically we call a central bank, that can decide how much money we need to produce in a time of crisis. Gold can't do it. Those people who are advocates of a return to the gold standard uh, may feel that at least the value of gold is independent of decisions by governments. And if governments make poor decisions, that's an attraction of gold. But gold has an attraction precisely because it's fixed in supply in the short term. And it's precisely because it's fixed in supply that it cannot play the role <clears throat> of being the supply of liquidity or security when there's a financial crisis. Somebody has to step in to do that. And of course, after the financial crisis of 1907 on Wall Street, that's why steps were taken to create the Federal Reserve, which had its first meeting in August 1914.